Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this wonderful day, Lord. And Father, thank you for allowing us all to gather here once more to study your word. And Father, I just ask that as we open your word, Father, that we would uh, learn more and we'd have a desire and a burning passion to learn all that we can from your uh, most blessed of books. And Father, I just ask that today we would uh, just wonder and marvel at your wonderful works. In your holy son's name we pray. Amen. Uh, Turn, if you will, to Acts chapter 8. And we're going to pick up in verse number 30. Acts chapter 8 and verse number 30, I've titled this message, Understandest What Thou Readest. Because the Bible has a lot of difficult passages. You know, it's an old saying, if you give a man a fish, you feed him for a day. If you teach a man to fish, you feed him for a lifetime. And so what we're going to try and do is just study a little bit about studying. Okay, the very fancy word for it is hermeneutics, but we're not going to call it that. We're going to call it understanding what we're reading. Okay. Now, how many of you guys have been to the Badlands before? It's a small group. Don't be shy. How many of you guys have ever explored out there? It's beautiful. The land is absolutely gorgeous. Uh, when we were living in Watford City the last three years out there, uh, we were really blessed, and we lived about 10 minutes away from the entrance to the Mata Hay Trail, which is one of the top 10 trails in the U.S. in terms of long distance. It's beautiful, gorgeous out there. One of the places called the Rainbow Canyon. There's wild stallions. There's bighorn sheep. There's buffalo. It's a beautiful area. And so we'd go explore it all the time, you know, especially during the summer. We'd go out there and we'd just go for walks. And there were some really beautiful paths out there, some trails. And those trails are always so cool because I wonder how much maintenance do they really have to do? Because you can kind of see just this little path winding through that people have stepped on over and over and over again. They make this path. And those paths are great. They're beautiful. They'll take you up to these gorgeous vistas. You can kind of see the land and you can look at it and you can get an appreciation for a lot of different things out there. And they'll take you by these prairie dog towns and these other sites. There's some caves that they'll take you by. They'll take you up on top of these bluffs so you get a nice view of the entire canyon. It's gorgeous. But after you go across those paths a couple times, you start to get a little bit of an itch to wander off the old path. You want to kind of go and explore in the crevasses a little bit. You want to go dig inside the cave. Now, we'd go with the Dennis's, okay? Uh, Pastor Dave Dennis and his wife Patty. We'd go in those trails with them. But then we started wandering off the trails, and it was a lot of fun. You know, you just kind of pick a point that you want to go to, and you just go. You wander. Now, the path is a little bit more difficult. I remember we had little Chloe at one point, and she's this tiny thing. We had one of those baby harnesses where she'd sit up in front. And so her little chubby legs would be dangling, and I'd be climbing up this rock face, and so she'd be about a couple inches away (laughs) trusting Dad to bring her up the top of this thing. But it was fun, and we'd see lots of different cool things. We found seashells out there. And one time the dentist has even found a full turtle shell, perfectly preserved upside down. You know, there's a geocache out there that we found. There's a lot of cool stuff going off the beaten path, a lot of beautiful things to find. But it does require a little bit more care. See, the nice thing about those beaten paths is that they're beaten. There's not a whole lot of potholes in there. They're prepared. They're ready to go. They're easy. But if you go off the path, you've got to pay more attention to where the holes are. You've got to be looking for snakes a little bit more. You've got to look for the different animals out there. You know, it's a, one thing to go walking down a trail and you start coming back the same way and all of a sudden there's a herd of buffalo standing in the middle of that path. You think, you know what? The buffalo really don't care where we put our trails. We'll have to go around. If you're ever going out there and you're afraid of snakes, take Patty Dennis with you. Okay? One time we're walking along this trail. Quick story and then we'll get back to the meat of the message. Okay? One time we're going on this trail and she's walking along and a snake comes right across the path. And so she comes up to it. And I don't know how she did it. I think she must be related to Chuck Norris in some way. Because she stepped on the snake. And then she realized she stepped on the snake. And she panicked and kicked her foot out. Completely decapitated the snake's head. Sent it flying. <laughs> Just the head. And so, I mean, if she had tried to do that, it was incredible. She was panicking. <laughs> we all were panicking. But she kicked the head off a snake. How many of you guys can say you did that? So anyway, every time I see a snake, that's what I try and do. (laughs) Not the greatest idea. But it's fun to go off the beaten path. We just have to be a little bit more careful. Now, in the Bible, we have these beaten paths. We have these tried and true, these places that we're comfortable with. But sometimes we don't really dig in deeper because we're kind of afraid of going out of our comfort zone. We're happy where we are. We, We go over these hard passages and we kind of just glance by them. Uh, We're not going to really pay much attention to that. We're going to go to the tried and true, the ones that are easily understood, and never dig much deeper. So what we're going to talk about today is understanding what we read. So the Bible says in Acts chapter 8, verse number 30, And Philip ran thither to meet him, and heard him read the prophet Isaiah, and said, Understandest thou 
what thou readest. So here we see Philip coming up to this eunuch, and he's asking, hey, here's the scroll of the Bible. He's reading from the book of Isaiah, and Philip asks him, do you understand what you're reading? Okay, and the eunuch said, no. Why? Why didn't he understand? Okay, we're going to go over the ingredients to understanding the Bible first before we go over how. And in order to understand, the problem that the Ethiopian eunuch had, number one, first and foremost, above all else, was that he was lost. He wasn't saved. He couldn't understand. He needed someone to show him because he was lost. That was the issue. Uh, There's no other breakdown there. If If a person is lost, the Bible is not ready for them. They can't understand it yet. There's some other things that need to be settled first, namely salvation. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 2.14, But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. If you're not saved, you cannot understand the Bible. And that's not meant to be offensive, that's not meant to be rude, but it's impossible according to the Bible. It's spiritually discerned. If you have not the Spirit, your spirit is dead. You cannot discern spiritual things if you have no spirit. If the Holy Spirit of God is not indwelling you in salvation, you cannot understand the Bible. Salvation comes first. You know, asking a lost person to understand the deeper truths of the Bible is like asking a blind person to fly a plane. It's going to end with a crash. <laughs> It's not going to go very well. These things are spiritually discerned. We must have the Spirit. And if we try and give people doctrine outside of salvation, if we don't go into the gospel first, if we just ignore their salvation problem and we say, okay, even though you're not saved, we're going to teach you some other stuff. Hey, let's go over the law. We're going to run into some serious issues. I think we are in danger of making them twice the child of hell because now they're going to build up their own self-righteousness because they're living according to a Bible that they haven't accepted as being truth in the gospel. They haven't repented of their sins. They haven't seen themselves as a sinner. So why teach them to behave like a Christian when they're not? That just adds confusion. Giving them an understanding outside of salvation is a complete waste of time because until a person is saved, all the Bible in the world will not do them an ounce of good. There are very many lost Bible scholars that know the Bible very well. I would say the devil himself probably knows the Bible very well. He could probably quote it to you forwards and backwards, but it doesn't do him an ounce of good because there is no repentance. There is no faith in Jesus Christ. There is no salvation. It's no good. It doesn't matter. The Bible says in James chapter 1, verse number 5, the other thing that we need. So first, we need salvation. Without salvation, it's a moot point. It's a waste of time. So first comes salvation. Secondly, we need to have spiritual guidance from Jesus Christ, from the Holy Spirit, from God himself. The Bible says in James 1, 5, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, that giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. God says if we have a question, if we need wisdom, if we need to know something, if there's some point of confusion, the very first thing we need to do is come to him, to ask him. He says that he giveth to all men liberally. He says if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God. Hey, that's not just a maybe I'll give you wisdom. You know, there are some promises in the Bible uh, that, you know, God says we can pray about, but he doesn't guarantee an answer. This is not one of them. He says, I guarantee it. If you ask for wisdom, I will give it. That's a promise. That's a check that we can go to the bank and we can cash. It's 100% guaranteed. Hey, we can ask God for wisdom. If we want to understand the Bible, we need that wisdom. So ask questions. You know, a lot of times we go and maybe in college or high school or whatever it is that we're learning, we're afraid of asking questions. We don't want to be seen as dumb. (laughs) I don't like being seen as dumb. It's really hard for me to do because, you know, natural does. (laughs) Anyway, but we have to ask questions. We don't learn until we're asking questions. And as we're reading through the Bible, it's okay to ask questions. God says, come, let us reason together. Okay, in order for there to be a reasoning, there needs to be a questioning. What is going on? What, What is happening here? How do I understand this? What do I do with this information? Because we know the information is good, but really, why is it there? The Bible's a thick book. There's a lot of information in there. Why? Ask questions. I mean, really, ask questions. Dig in deep. Why is this so important? There are some passages in the Bible that we can sit and look at. Why is it in there? And that's a good question to ask. We ought to be asking those questions to get thinking about spiritual things, about the things of God. Okay, so this has been divided into three parts. 
So that's, consider that a little introduction. Now, I do want to give credit where it's due. Brother Venom helped me tremendously with that. He teaches a hermeneutics class that goes into a lot more detail. So this is kind of a crash course. But this is his outline. Okay, I've thrown in some verses and stuff like that. So if there's anything that says, man, this is really good, Brother Venom. If there's anything else, <laughs> you're welcome. <laughs> All right. So number one, the author's intention is what we need to understand. So if you're taking notes, number one, we need to know when we're reading the Bible, the author's intention. What does it say? When we read the Bible, the most important thing are the words on the page. What does it say? The Bible says in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse number 20, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. The first thing we need to do is to read it commonly. Just what does it say? Just read it. Just open your Bible, take it out, and read it. You know, a lot of times when we're reading through our Bible, we'll find something that we don't quite understand, and maybe a little red flag goes up on our heads, and we get uncomfortable, and maybe our natural tendency is just be like, okay, we're just going to move on. We're going to go back to the familiar places, back to the familiar past. We're just not going to deal with that right now. You know, there are a lot of different things that, you know, I get uncomfortable, and it's easier just to kind of, okay, we're just going to put that away and not deal with it. Uh, recently, I've been working on a house from time to time, and uh, I had to do some outlets, okay? How many of you guys like working with electricity? No one, see? Just like me. Oh, wait, wait, we've got two over there. <laughs> you guys live by faith. Uh, <laughs> I don't like working with electricity. The whole idea of this wire, whether it's going to kill me or not, looks the exact same. <laughs> and I have to trust that I either flip the right switch or something like that, and I don't trust me to lock the doors at night. <laughs> I don't know about that. Well, anyway, so Jared is going to teach me how to wire this, my outlets. And so he comes and he takes it and he's like, okay, Josh, all it is is you have the outlet and you got these little screws in the side. All you do is you just wrap the wire and you tighten the screw. Now, I had always been terrified of working with electricity, but I saw him do it. And I was like, you know what? That's not that bad. It's really not that scary. And so I started thinking about it a little bit. You know, I don't think most electrical supply places want all their customers dying. I think they try and make it safe. And if you look across the board, many complex issues, many complex things, tasks, jobs, really when broken down, are pretty simple. They're designed to be safe. They're designed to be easily understood so that their customers, you know, know the products and are comfortable using them. Now, the Bible is not a product. It's the Word of God. But God didn't give it to us so that we could be destroyed by it. It's to be easily understood. He wants it so that we can understand it. Why would he give it to us if it's some kind of a puzzle that we're never going to solve? You know, there's just some things that we'll never understand. And while there are some things in our personal lives that we'll never understand, the written word of God, while there may be some points that are harder to understand, was a book that was made to be understood. Otherwise, he wouldn't have written it. He wouldn't have told us if he didn't want us to understand what was there. And so what we need to do is just first and foremost, read it. And then understand when plain sense makes common sense, seek no other sense or it all becomes nonsense. And let me say that one more time. It's not my quote. I'm just regurgitating what I've learned. When the plain sense makes common sense, seek no other sense or it all becomes nonsense. The Bible says what it says. And if we understand what it says, we understand. That's it. We don't need to go into some kind of deep over-spiritualization and try and make it sound like it's something that it's not. Okay? The Bible says what it says. And we need to learn to accept it. Also, we need to understand that what we need to know from the Bible is always clear. Okay? Major doctrine is clear. Look in Hebrews chapter 5. Hebrews chapter 5, we're going to pick it up in verse number 12. Hebrews chapter 5, verse number 12, the Bible says, For when the time ye ought to be teachers, ye have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as have need of milk, and not of strong meat. For everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. He's a babe. Now the Bible is making a differentiation here. It said, look, there's strong meat, and then there's milk. There are these first oracles of God. There are these primary doctrines, these major issues that God has made very clear. 
Okay, this is the milk of the word of God. Everything basic and essential for doctrine and practice is clearly presented. Yeah, there's no if and or buts. Major doctrinal issues such as salvation. Salvation is very clearly presented in the Bible. Okay? It's milk. It's the starting point. It's the oracles. You know, I have a little baby girl. She needs milk. She's given milk. I need something more than milk. <laughs> milk is not going to cut it for my diet. I need something else. But, you know, raising my daughter while giving her this milk, there's some very basic truths, some very basic understanding that she needs to be taught. And the very first thing that maybe all of you have taught your kids, if you have kids, at least for me, it was saying mom and dad's name. Mama, dada. It's the very first thing. I want my kid to know me. I want when they walk into a room, I see them smile. I want them to say, dad, 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 dad. That's the first and foremost priority. And mama, yeah, her too, also important. But I want that relationship. First thing that we need to learn is to call upon the name of your parent. And I think that's a very basic, essential thing that we can call upon the name of the Lord. Very basic. Second thing I need to teach my daughter, no. No. Don't do that. Wrong. That will hurt you. No. Bad. Don't stick that in your mouth. Really, stop sticking that in your mouth. Okay? No. Every kid needs to learn no. Guess what God does with us? He says some very clear no's in the Bible. He says we can call upon him, and then he says some things, no. And then we grow from there. Next, I want my children to learn, uh, <laughs> basically, okay, you can do this. Here's a yes. Okay, then I want to teach them how to obey. And there's an expansion that grows. They get bigger. God does the same thing with us, but he gives us some basic truth, some foundational principles, some truth that's going to serve them the rest of their life. Okay? I want my kids to know they can call on me, dad, dad. I want them to know what no means, and I want them to know to obey. If I can teach them those three foundational truths as a child, they're going to be okay in life. They're going to be set up for a while. Okay? God has given us foundational truths that are very easy to be understood. Look in Hebrews chapter 4 and verse number 12. So not only do we see reading commonly, getting a basic understanding that God has made clear, but we see reading contextually. And that is very simply put, to put yourself in the scene. Understand where that passage is sitting and how it fits in with that chapter, with that book, within the framework of the Bible. Putting things in context. The Bible says in Hebrews 4.12, For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joint and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Okay? The word of God gets to the heart of the issue. Okay? It's a discerner. We should be trying to discern what is the Bible discerning here. Understanding what is the Bible trying to communicate with us. And there's some very simple questions that we can ask to figure that out. Who is it written by? Who is it written to? Who is speaking? We can ask, what is this talking about? What is this passage dealing with? What is this chapter dealing with? When was it written? When is it set? When in history are we saying this? Where was it written? Where was the individual when it was written? Where was the individual going? Where had been the individual? What is going on in that person's life? Why was it written? Why are these words recorded in the Bible for all eternity? Why is it there? Ask these questions in that passage and then try and figure it out. I almost would like to say get in character a little bit. Try and understand the motivations of the person that is reading the Bible. Let me put it this way. Let's say we're reading in Joshua and we're going to the Battle of Jericho. Okay? Now we can just kind of read through it and we can kind of skim and, okay, Joshua, you know, he goes out and he, and he sees and there's the captain of the Lord's host. He talks to him. He goes back out and they walk around the city a bunch of times. It falls down. They conquer. Great. Got it. But we're not really understanding the heart of the issue. We're not putting ourselves in the shoes of Joshua or the children of Israel as they're going through it or even the people in Jericho. I mean, think about it. That was a lot of information going on. Here's Joshua, and he's going out of the camp. And who knows why he's going out? The Bible doesn't record. But God does give, give us an imagination. We can try and understand maybe what he was thinking. This is the first major battle in the campaign in Canaan. They're going to be conquering the entire promised land. This is the first step, and Joshua has just recently taken over for Moses. He's got a lot of responsibility. He's probably thinking, man, this needs to go well. We need to start on the right, right foot. And that's Jericho. That's a big city with big walls. And so he goes out of the camp and he's by himself. Could be that maybe he's a little concerned. 
You know, they've had open field battles. We haven't had a kind of a siege before. How are we going to do this? What are we going to do? And so he goes out of the camp, and maybe he's just going to go and take a look at it. Maybe he's going to go and pray and try and get God's heart on the matter because he doesn't know what he's going to do. But there, he sees the captain of the Lord's host staring out at the city. And here the battle starts off. It's not Joshua's plan. It's not Joshua's word that they go by. It's what God says. Or think about the battle itself. So they're walking around. Okay, imagine from the the picture of the inhabitants of Jericho. They're standing on their wall, and they're afraid. Okay, these guys aren't confident. I've seen a picture before where they're mocking the Israelites as they walk around. No, that's not what's happening. They were afraid. The people were terrified of the Israelites. And I want you to imagine being on that wall, and all of a sudden you see a nation come to your city gates, and then without saying a word, walk around. Can you imagine standing there and having a tiger just kind of walk around you? I bet it was really quiet. And they watched him walk around, and then they left. And those inhabitants of Jericho are probably going, what is going on? And then they do it the second day. And they're like, oh man, they're back. Is this the day they're going to attack? And they go back around. Quiet as can be. (laughs) The tension had to be killer. And they do this until the last day where the Israelites, they circle around, not once. (laughs) Guys, things are changing. (laughs) They're doing it again. And they go around again and again and again. Once again, quiet. Until all of a sudden those priests that have been marching around the city blow the trumpets. You want to talk about a silence breaker. Imagine you're sleeping peacefully and all of a sudden air horn in your ear. The trumpets are blown and then all the people shout, which... Once again, I'd be terrified if I was on that wall. But then the wall collapses. Picture that. There's a lot of information going in there. There's a lot we can talk about. God gave us an imagination. It's okay to exercise it once in a while. There's nothing wrong with that. We need to get in the the picture of what's going on. This really happened. Try and understand what is going on. Why did God tell us about this? And then we broaden it. The Bible says in 2 Timothy 2, 7, Consider what I say, and the Lord give the understanding in all things. We need to have understanding in all things. We need to get the bigger picture. We need the context. There's lots of different kinds of context. We have uh, immediate context, what is happening in that exact moment. We have the secondary context, what's the entire theme of that book. There's a broad context. Within the passages of the Bible, where does it fit in? You have a topical context, so dealing with a specific issue. How does it compare to other passages of the Bible? And then you have a doctrinal context. Okay? What am I doing with this information to build my life upon and the context of my doctrine, what I believe? There's a lot of different contexts. There's a lot of different information, and it all matters. It all has an application. What does it say? What does the Bible say? Because if you're not paying attention to context, okay, you have to pay attention to the context. If you're not paying attention to context, you can get really messed up. You can make the Bible say pretty much whatever you want it to say if you rip verses out of context. If you lack context and scruples, you can make whatever doctrine you want to. We need context. We can't just take whatever passage we want to, cherry pick it, and call it doctrine. We need to know what is happening. We need to understand the setting. We need to understand the author. We need to know the full picture. We also need to read comparatively. So we need to read contextually. We need to read commonly. But we need to read comparatively. First, we need to understand that the Bible interprets itself. First Peter, or First Corinthians chapter 2, verse number 13, the Bible says, Which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. Okay? So we compare spiritual issues with spiritual answers. Spiritual and spiritual. We don't go outside of that. Okay? Um, the obscure must always give way to the clear. Okay, that's a very good rule of thumb. If something is easily understood... Okay, it's understood. It's common. We get it. Now, if something is not so easily understood, we need to go back to the common, what we do understand, to compare it. Let me put it this way. Let's say you have a puzzle, okay? And it's a nice big puzzle, a thousand-piece puzzle, whatever a good-sized puzzle is, I don't know. I deal with, like, ten-piece puzzles with my children. But let's say there's a giant puzzle that you're putting together. And what are the very first pieces that you're going to grab? It's the corners. If you have any kind of experience with a puzzle, you're going to use the corner pieces, you're not going to grab like a middle one, like let's say it's a nice vista of uh, the Grand Canyon. You're not going to grab one, you know, blue square number 98. 
in the middle and start with that. Like, okay, now we've got to match the hues exactly, specifically. I don't know what hues are. Okay, we go to the paint store. Okay, blue, <laughs> green, orange. And that's pretty much it. I can't do that. I have to start with the corners and work my way in. Okay. The obscure, the hard to understand, has to be connected to the easy to be understood. We build off of the easily understood and we compare the hard to the easy. And we build our understanding from there. Uh, look in Matthew chapter 5, verse number 18. Matthew chapter 5, verse number 18. So we see when reading comparatively, the Bible interprets itself, but there may be these apparent contradictions. Okay? They're not real contradictions, but they can seem that way at first glance. Matthew chapter 5, verse number 18. Here's what we need to understand. There is not a right passage of Scripture and a wrong passage of Scripture. They are both right. It's just which ones do we understand and how do we understand the ones that we don't get quite yet. Okay? There is no such thing as a wrong passage of Scripture. There are no contradictions, no true contradictions. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 5, verse number 18, Jesus Christ speaking says, For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. So in no place does the Bible contradict itself. Although there are places where there are apparent contradictions, where it seems like there's something that's not right, that proper study will resolve. We have to study it out. We have to dig a little bit deeper. We have to look a little bit harder. Okay, here's an easy example. Okay, so the Bible says, one of the Ten Commandments, honor thy father and thy mother. Does the Bible say honor thy father and thy mother? Absolutely, yes, very clearly. But Jesus Christ also taught, if any man hate not his father or his mother, he's not worthy of the kingdom of God. Oh, no. <laughs> Panic button. There's a contradiction. Hey, the law says, honor thy father and mother. Jesus Christ says, hate thy father and mother. Hold on. <laughs> Calm down a little bit. Now, you guys already know this, but that can happen. At least in the moment when we're reading it, we can have this little panic button like, oh, no, everything's falling apart. It's all a lie. <laughs> Calm down. <laughs> Relax. <laughs> okay. The answer is obvious when you sit and think about it a little bit more. We ought to love God rather than men. If we have to disobey our parents to obey God, we ought to obey God. Every man's accountable directly to God for themselves. The Bible teaches that. Okay? Just because there's an apparent contradiction, something that at first glance doesn't make sense, it doesn't mean that we ignore it or we put it away. It's time to take a, take a harder look, take a second glance, or a third or a fourth or a fifth, however long it takes. So what does the Bible say? Secondly, we need to understand what does the Bible mean? The reader's interpretation, what does it mean? The origination of errors come from one of two different ways. First is misreading the text. Okay, the Bible says in 2 Peter 3.16, is also in his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest, as they do also other scriptures under their own destruction. Okay, he says, Peter's saying, look, there's some hard scriptures. There's some hard passages. And sometimes we just don't understand them. We just don't know what the words mean. There's a lot of different things that, you know what, if we don't really do a deep dive, we can have a hard time understanding. There's a lot of different issues that people just don't know what the words mean. Now, we don't have time to go into grammar, and I am not the right person to teach grammar. But there are some basic examples that we can understand. So, for example, the Bible says that God is a jealous God. And so maybe in our own thought, we think, oh, man, God is jealous? And we think of jealousy as a sin. But jealousy is really wanting what you already have. Envy is a sin. That's wanting what somebody else has. But my daughters, I am jealous over them. They are mine. You cannot have them. <laughs> hey, I'm not sharing. My wife, I am jealous over my wife. I will not share my wife. Okay, God is a jealous God. He will not share us. Not with sin, not with the devil, not with the world. Okay, he is a jealous God. There's other doctrines. Baptism. Okay, we've talked about that at length here at Fargo Baptist. I know that we've talked about it. The word baptize means to dunk. But there's confusion over what that word means. Okay, the gospel. If you go and ask your average person on the street, what is the gospel, you're going to get all sorts of different answers. Because people have changed their definition. They don't understand the definition of the word, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Okay? That's what the gospel is. But if you ask somebody, what's the gospel? Oh, you know, it's the golden rule, do unto others. Well, what's the gospel? Okay, try and please God, be a good person. What's the gospel? Oh, you've got to be baptized. Okay? Lots of different variations for the gospel, but it's not about what I think. It's not about what other people think. It's about what God says. Okay? We can get off if we misunderstand the words. The second time we can get off is in uh, reading into the text. 
making it say what you want it to say. So not just misinterpreting the Bible, not just misreading, but trying to put your own views into the Bible. Uh, the Bible says in Matthew chapter 22, verse number 29, Jesus answered and said unto them, Ye do err, not knowing the Scriptures, nor the power of God. So in this case, Jesus is dealing with some Pharisees, and they say there is no resurrection. He's like, you do err. You're making a mistake. You're reading into the Bible what you already think, and you're putting it in there. So, really easy one. Uh, we, infant baptism. There is no example of a baby getting baptized. But people look in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse number 16, and they say, look, the household of Stephanus got baptized. They believed, and they got baptized. So surely there was a baby in there. There must have been a baby in there. What household doesn't have a baby? <laughs> My household has babies. Not everyone in here, not everyone has a baby right now. Hey, otherwise, that nursery would be a little bit more full. It's a very great full nursery. But we're reading into it. We're making it say what we want it to say. And this isn't just other religions. I know I myself can be guilty of this. In uh, Revelation, I believe it's uh, chapter number 15, and in verse number 3, now that I look at my notes, we see this reference to the Song of Moses being sung. And it's right after chapter 14 deals with this battle that takes place where the, horse, the blood rises up to the horse's bridle. And then immediately afterwards, the next thing that seems to occur is that the saints are singing the Song of Moses. And so, I'm wondering, okay, well, what is the Song of Moses? Do we know it? So, I go all the way back in the Bible, and I find the Song of Moses. It's called the Song of Moses after the children of Israel crossed the Red Sea. And so I'm excited. Like, well, why would they sing that battle after that battle, the Song of Moses crossing the Red Sea, and then here is God delivering the, the people once again, winning this battle. And hey, you know what's red? Blood. And so I look it up online. I'm like, hey, well, what's going on in, in the Middle East in that area? There's a particular valley there. Let's look it up. And I saw that there was a dam being built in that feeds into that valley from the Red Sea. Like, if that dam broke, that water would pour into the valley. It would fill it up. It's the Red Sea. The, the, the water has covered up the enemies, just like it did with the Egyptians. It's amazing. It's the exact same thing happening all over again. God's going to wash over the enemies with the water of the Red Sea. That's why they're singing the Song of Moses. And I get all excited, but then I think about it, and uh, hold on. God said blood. Can you see the issue that might happen if I equate the water from the Red Sea with being the blood? You see, it seems like a small thing. It's a little issue. But I think I found something. I start reading into it, and all of a sudden, I've equated blood with water. I could get really off doctrinally if I started mixing water and blood. Because those are two very separate things. I started reading into it what I wanted to see. I thought I had figured it out. I had solved the puzzle of the Bible in my pride, and I could have messed people up majorly doctrinally. When the Bible says blood, it means blood. When God says blood, God means blood. Blood is blood. Blood is not water. In no place is it water. Who am I to start making it equal? I am not. We need to be careful that we're not reading in what we want to be there, what we want to see. So that's the origination of errors. But then when we're rightly dividing the word of truth, when we're trying to understand what does it mean, we're trying to figure out what is God trying to tell me, we need to get all the information. The Bible says in Acts chapter 17, verse number 11, These were more noble than those in Thessalonica, and that they received the word with all readiness of mind, and search the scriptures daily, whether those things were so. Explore the word of God and get every last bit of information that you can. There's word studies, chapter studies, book studies, doctrinal studies, all sorts of different studies you can do. But before you can build a case, you need to gather the evidence. Okay? When I'm building a sermon, when I'm making a message, the very first thing that I try and do, before I start putting in my outline or my thoughts or how I should divide it up, I get all the information. I'm going to go and I'm going to study out the words in the Bible. I'm going to try and study out the chapters. And I'm going to get all the Bible in its purest form and just lay it out. And then from there, God makes clear what he's trying to communicate. Not Josh making clear what I'm trying to communicate. And then I try and find verses to fill in my blanks. Okay? God has the information. And then I try and sort it in a way that makes sense so that I can understand it. And then I share it with others. You have to gather all the information first if you're studying something out. Get a complete picture. And then you need to make sure that you're sticking to the facts. Matthew chapter 15, verse number 9 says, But in vain they do worship me, teaching the doctrines of the com excuse me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. Okay? We need facts, not theory. We need clear, 
not conjecture. We can guess, we can want, we can, we can try and put our own ideas into pretty much anything. Okay, that's what we do. That's our understanding is kind of burnt, the Bible says. So we just need the Word of God in its purest form. We need Bible. Okay? There's certain evidence that is inadmissible at court. You know, there's some things that maybe we really like that we kind of look for in everything. Okay, I know a guy, a great man, that he's always looking at end times prophecy. And everything that he sees, he's, he's, he's got an eye towards end times prophecy. I could probably be accused of that with witnessing. I love witnessing. I love everything about witnessing. When I'm reading in my Bible and I find a passage that I think has something to do with witnessing, I get really excited and all of a sudden I want to preach it and teach it. Everything is about witnessing. You know, Genesis, the origination of witnesses. Then you have Exodus, the calling out of witnesses. And then in Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, that's the separation, preparation, and uh, uh, there's another fancy word that ends in shun, so just take my word for it, of witnesses. And then you have Judges, trials of witnesses, Joshua, battles of witnesses, Ruth, I don't know. But then you have the major and minor prophets. Might as well be called the major and minor witnesses. Am I right? And we can read into everything. (laughs) We can put our own spin on it in our own mind. We just need to take God at his word. What does he say? What does it mean? Not trying to put in our own thoughts, our own hopes, our own wants. We need the facts. And then rightly dividing is understanding what God is saying to us. It is getting the full and complete picture. The Bible says in 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. It means something. We have to understand when rightly dividing, every verse is there for a reason. There is no wasted words. Every word means something. We have to have that belief so we're not cutting out stuff that doesn't belong. Rightly dividing, it's speaking of cutting. We have to cut. We have to separate between two. That's what dividing is. But we need to make sure that we're dividing correctly. And the first and foremost thing we need to understand when dividing correctly is that there is no wasted words. Not a single word is there by accident or as fluff or filler material. Okay? If God can say, let there be light, and that's enough for all light to suddenly come into existence, then we cannot say that there is any individual word that does not belong there. God doesn't waste his breath. His breath is life. His word is life. We need his word. Every last word. So we need to find out what is the reason. Having that conviction that there is a reason. It's not just there to be there. What is the reason? The Bible says in 2 Timothy 2.15, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. That means to separate correctly. Because here's the thing with Bible. Not every piece is directly connected. So let's go back to this puzzle illustration. Okay? Every verse in the Bible is part of the larger picture. It fits in somewhere. It's in there. It's truth. But that doesn't mean that every individual piece connects directly. What happens if you take two puzzle pieces that don't directly fit and you try and smash them together? It's disjointed. It's going to mess up the picture. You're going to have problems. Does it belong in the puzzle? Yes, absolutely. But rightly dividing is understanding that they don't necessarily connect. When going through the scripture, that the pieces make sense, that there's a flow, that there's an easy understanding. Okay, we can't force the fit. If there's something that doesn't seem to fit, so we're studying out and, man, we're just having a hard time reconciling what God says in the word, maybe we need to step, take a step back and see if we're not trying to force something in that really doesn't belong. Maybe the problem is that we're not rightly dividing and separating the issues, and we need to take a step back and get a look at the big picture and make sure that that's really where that belongs. We're going to try and look at an example in just a minute. We're running out of time, but quickly, I want to talk about the believer's imperative. Okay? So what does it matter? So what does the Bible say? What does it mean? And then what does it matter? Once we know what God means, what does it matter? What do I do with this information? The Bible says in Deuteronomy chapter 17, verse number 9, we see a universal appeal. And it shall be with him, and he shall read therein all the days of his life, that he may learn to fear the Lord his God, and to keep all the words of this law and these statutes to do them. Okay? So what can we learn? What can we do with them? Here we find that God has divided it into kind of two easy sections. Here's the word of God. It's divided into two. We either learn about God or about how we're supposed to behave about God's behavior, or about our behavior. Okay, we're learning more about him, we're learning more about us. Okay, that's how we can easily divide the two. Okay, it's a very simple division, but it works. 
The question is, what are some applications with that truth? What do we do with that knowledge? Now that we know this is about God, what do I do with it? Now that we know this is about us, how we're supposed to live, what do I do about it? The Bible says in Jeremiah 15, 16, Thy words were found, and I did eat them. And thy word was unto me the joy and rejoicing of mine heart. For I am called by thy name, O Lord God of hosts. Now the Bible has one interpretation. Any particular passage doesn't have 20 different interpretations. It has one interpretation. It means what it means. But what it matters, the application of that passage, there's a whole bunch of different possibilities. There are a ton of different options. Let me put it this way. I love potatoes. But a potato is a potato. It's just a potato. It means potato. But I can take that potato, and I can do all sorts of different things with it. I can make baked potato, twice-baked potato, mashed potato, french fries, chips. There's all sorts of different applications for a potato. And in the Bible... There are many different applications for a single verse. Now, it means one thing, but there's a lot of different ways that we can use it. And that's why you see in many sermons the same verses that are used over and over again. Lots of different applications, one verse. It's a staple verse, you could say. But it's not enough just to know. There has to be a personal application. So understanding it is great. Preparing a dish, wonderful. But you have to eat it. What does it matter to me personally? James 1.22 says, But be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. You know, I have a weight bench in my basement. It's in my basement, so every time I go do laundry, I see that weight bench. And I go over to it, and I think about myself doing reps. I really strongly consider lifting it and putting it down again, and then lifting it and doing it down, putting it down again. And I understand it. I get it. I understand how this works. But until I actually grab it and do it, nothing really changes. It doesn't matter. Until an application takes place, it's just information. The Bible says in uh, James chapter 1, verses 23 through 25, For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like unto a man, beholding his natural face in a glass, for he beholdeth himself and goeth his way, and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. You have to do something with the information. You're not going to receive the blessings. It's not going to be used. It's just words on a page until it's applied to your life, until you act it out, until you live it out, until you take what you've learned and do something with it, then it stays confined to the word of God. We need it in our lives. We have to do something with that information. So the question is, what results do you want to see? Study it out. Go look. Find out. And then do it. And then, lastly, communicating truth. So once we have this truth and we're applying it, how do we tell somebody else about it? How do we share this truth? Okay, well, first and foremost, you need to suggest means. Practical examples and illustrations. Uh, 1 Corinthians 10, 11 says, Now all these things happened unto them for examples, and they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. What are the practical steps for someone to do? What can we do with it? How do we take this information and apply it in our lives? And so here's what I'd like to do. I want to give you a practical step. Now, we're out of time. I talk too long, and so we're not going to have time to do it together. But here's what I want you to do, okay? And I I, I want us to see looks of shock. So even if you don't, aren't that shocked, I want you to look shocked because I I really want to end with the bang. We're going to practice. Here's what we're going to practice, all right? I want you to study out slavery in the Bible. (laughs) Hey, thank you. I got some shocked looks. Perfect. (laughs) What does the Bible say about it? Here, we'll do a little bit of an appetizer, a little uh, wet your whistle here. Numbers chapter, er, Exodus chapter 21, verse number 16, or excuse me, Numbers chapter 31, verse number 9, the Bible says, And all the children of Israel took all the women of Midian captives and their little ones and took the spoil of all their cattle and all their flocks and all their goods. Boy, oh boy, that sounds like slavery, doesn't it? They're taking captives. Why? What is going on here? What's happening? Are you saying that the Bible condones slavery? At the whole Civil War thing, the South was right. I'm a Yankee. The South is never right. <laughs> Just kidding. So any of you Southerners out there, I wanted one more shock look. <laughs> okay. Does the Bible condone slavery? Okay. Now, I don't want to leave you on that note because then if I just leave you right there, then you're going to be spending the rest of the day wondering, and then if you don't study it out, now you're going to have that kind of a sliver sticking in your foot. So, okay, I'm going to give you the clear answer. 
Okay, so here is the corner piece that you can build it out where the doctrine is very clearly presented with no uncertain terms, and it's found in Exodus chapter 21, verse number 16, where the Bible very clearly states, And he that stealeth a man and selleth him, or if he be found in his hand, he shall surely be put to death. That's clear. That's very concise. The Bible says if you steal a man and you sell him, you'll be put to death. Okay? So here's a thought that I want to help you with. Okay? If the Bible says very clearly, do not do this, which is typically what we look at slavery as, maybe we need to understand what a servant is in the Bible, because the word slave is actually never used in the Old Testament. Now, people have been accusing the Bible of saying that, oh, the Bible condones use of slaves, but the slave isn't there. It's not in the Old Testament. It's not there. It just doesn't happen. So what's going on here? It says not to buy or sell any man. So why is it there? What can we learn from it? What's the application? Let me challenge you to study it out. Uh, if you're writing this down because you're actually going to do it, let me give you two more passages I think that will help you. Exodus chapter 21, verse number 26. If you are going to study it out. Exodus chapter 1, verse number 26. And then two more. Proverbs 29, 21. And Proverbs 17, 2. Proverbs 29, 21. And Proverbs 17, 2. I want you to study those passages Look up some other verses and try and figure it out. Try and study it out for yourself. So, in closing, very quickly, if there is a passage in the Bible that we're having a hard time to understand, we need to know three things. Number one, the author's intention. What does it say? Clearly, what does it say? Try and get an understanding of what's happening in this scenario. What's going on? In the case of slavery, what's the culture? What are the circumstances? What is happening in the world at that time? It's not the same as today. So put yourself there. Secondly, the reader's interpretation, what does it mean? What is God trying to get across? What are the principles that we can learn from this? And then finally, believer's imperative. What does it matter? What do I do with this information? Okay, so with the example I've given you, considering okay, this use of servants in the Old Testament, okay, what do I do with that? How does that apply today? Am I going to go capture a Canadian? <laughs> what do I do with it? Why do I need it today?